This is the DAR Today podcast, and I'm your host, Brooke Bullmaster Stewart. Well, as you know, sometimes on this podcast, we have breaking news. Well, this week, we do as well. Uh, I have to tell you, this is going to be our last podcast. Oh, wait a second. Wait. Oh, uh, my notes were upside down. Yeah, sorry about that. (laughs) Well, thanks for being here with us today. It is April 1st. Some call it April Fool's Day, so don't mind my little April Fool's joke. This is definitely not the end of these podcasts, so we have a great episode for you today, and I think you'll really enjoy it. How many times do we say our Americans' Creed for the opening rituals of our meetings, uh, at Continental Congress? What an incredible thing that is to hear all of these daughters and guests saying this Americans' Creed together. It's quite something. So today we're going to dive in deep to the meaning behind the phrases and also talk about the history of the man who created this creed, William Tyler Page. What an incredible patriotic American he was. I had the wonderful privilege and honor of getting to meet his granddaughter, Jody Adams, who lives in Southern California. Got to sit down and talk with her. And what a testament she is to this patriotic man who loved this country more than himself. And uh, she is a wonderful woman and a DAR member here in California. And we're also going to have a recitation of the Americans' Creed by members from all over the world. Members that are all different and yet are united in this love of country that we all have. And so I think you'll really like that segment as well. It's one of my favorites. And then we have a wonderful segment about the laying of the wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier by our President General in Rome last November during that Rome DAR Tours trip. What a poignant and moving ceremony that was, and I think you'll really enjoy that. So stick with us. Uh, Let us know in the comments, too, um, what you thought of the American's Creed when you first learned it. I think that'd be interesting to know. Um, Or what is your favorite part of the American's Creed? Uh, Do you have some special memory of that? So let's jump right into that American's Creed, to the history of it all. And again, thanks so much for being here with us today. Not unlike President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, in its brief yet poignant message, we might say nearly perfect in its simplicity. The American's Creed was born of key questions during a time of great turmoil for the United States citizens. The year was 1917, and as Americans joined the war overseas, attempting to save the world for democracy, it led some to wonder, why is America sending our sons to fight and die in a war so far away? What is patriotism, and is freedom and democracy worth the ultimate sacrifice? These questions weighed on the mind of New Yorker Henry Sterling Chapin, and that made him wonder, could a statement be created that embodies the answers to these questions? A statement that patriotic Americans would embrace and hold dear? To this point, he conceived the idea of a contest to discover such a statement, literally the founding of an American's creed. A contest was established and approved by then-President Woodrow Wilson, and a prize of $1,000, nearly $17,000 in today's money, was offered by Baltimore Mayor James Preston. Patriotic Baltimore, birthplace of the Star-Spangled Banner, would sponsor a contest prompting submission of over 3,000 entries and run from March to September of 1917. Members of the President's Cabinet, the House and Senate, state governors, the press, and well-known Americans comprised a committee to evaluate submissions, whittling them down to a final 50, and then ultimately to entry number 384, written by William Tyler Page of Friendship Heights, Maryland, a descendant of President Tyler and Declaration of Independence signer Carter Braxton. Page's entry was described as, and I quote, not only brief and simple, but also remarkably comprehensive of the best in American ideals, history, and tradition as expressed by the founders of the Republic and its greatest statesmen and writers." End quote. By the time of his submission, Page had already given 36 years of public service to the United States government beginning at the young age of 13 as a page in the House of Representatives, then elected to the position of majority clerk, and finally holding the post 
of Emeritus Minority Clerk, a position created for him specifically. Incredibly, he served under 11 presidents and 15 speakers during his more than 60-year tenure. The 49-year-old Page would draw inspiration from many sources, including the Bible, the Declaration of Independence, the Preamble to the Constitution, the Gettysburg Address, and a speech by Daniel Webster, crafting a final 100-word statement embodying the basic principles of American faith. When talking about his creation of the creed, Mr. Page told the story that while walking home from church one Sunday, following recitation there of the Apostles' Creed, he determined that a shorter and secular creed could be created based upon the Christian creed, yet the wording shouldn't be his own per se, but be derived from a set of statements embodying beliefs and faiths that Americans already held dear and agreed upon. Many of our founding documents and papers that Americans held in high regard that had already founded our great nation. Page would state, This is not an expression of individual opinion upon the obligations and duties of American citizenship or with respect to its rights and privileges. It is a summary of the fundamental principles of American political faith as set forth in its greatest documents, its worthiest traditions, and by its greatest leaders. The American's Creed was formally adopted by the House of Representatives on April 3, 1918, and read publicly in Congress by the Commissioner of Education just three days later. Less than 10 days after that, it was read for the first time during the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution's 27th Continental Congress, held April 15th to April 20th of 1918. I love the idea of this. President General Sarah Guernsey said to the assembled daughters, and I quote, We have the great pleasure and honor of having with us this morning the author of the American Screed, Mr. William Tyler Page. We will open the 28th Continental Congress by all rising and reading aloud the creed, which you will find in your program. Mr. Page will lead the reading, end quote. Well, as this is such a staple in our opening ritual for us as DAR members, something we just accept as part of what we know and do in DAR, I think it's interesting to think about these daughters reciting this for the first time, don't you? Well, Mr. Page returned again the following year at Continental Congress, and that became an annual tradition until the year of his death in 1942. Imagine seeing Mr. Page reciting that American's Creed at our Continental Congress every summer. That must have been something. The last public appearance of William Tyler Page occurred on an October Sunday evening in 1942 when he was our guest at a 50th anniversary celebration of the Pledge of Allegiance, and for the final time there, he led the assembly in the recitation of the American's Creed. The next day, on October 19, 1942, Mr. Page passed away of heart disease. The House of Representatives adjourned in his honor. The DAR added a bronze plaque to his grave, and our society passed a resolution that the third day of April should be set aside as the American's Creed Day. With regard to each of the statements that make up the American's Creed, William Tyler Page provided a reference guide with sources substantiating each component of the American's Creed and we would like to tell you about each one as we feel it truly tells the story of its significance. For the phrase, the United States of America, source, the preamble, the Constitution of the United States. For the phrase, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, sources, preamble, Constitution of the United States, and Daniel Webster's speech in the Senate from January 26, 1830, and from Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. For the phrase, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed, source, Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. For the phrase, a democracy in a republic, source, James Madison in the Federalist Papers Number 10, and Article 10 of the Amendments to the Constitution. For the phrase, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, sources, E Pluribus Unum from the Great Seal of the United States and Article 4 of the Constitution. For the phrase, a perfect union. Source, the preamble to the Constitution. For the phrase, one and inseparable. Source, Webster's speech in the Senate from January 26, 1830. 
phrase, established upon those principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity for which American patriots sacrificed their lives and fortunes. Source, the Declaration of Independence. From the phrase, I therefore believe it is my duty to my country to love it. The source for that, in substance from Edward Everett Hale's The Man Without a Country, published 1863. For the phrase, to support its constitution. The source, the Oath of Allegiance, section 1757, from the Revised Statutes of the United States. And from the phrase, to obey its laws. Sources, Washington's Farewell Address, and Article 6, Constitution of the United States. For the phrase, to respect its flag. The sources for that, National Anthem, the Star-Spangled Banner, Army and Navy Regulations, War Department Circular on Flag Etiquette from April 14th of 1917. And the final phrase, and to defend it against all enemies, the source for that, the Oath of Allegiance, Section 1757 from the Revised Statutes of the United States. Mr. Page truly did not want to use his own words. He wanted to find those incredible, already existing documents in our American history and compile those in this incredible 100-word American's Creed. What an honor it is to recite that still today. I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, for the people, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed, a democracy in a republic, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, a perfect union, one and inseparable, established upon those principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity, for which American patriots sacrificed their lives and fortunes. I therefore believe it is my duty to my country to love it, to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend it against all enemies. On the most recent DAR Tours trip to Rome, Italy, all in attendance were able to participate in a very moving event. This visit to the Eternal City began with a wreath laying, honoring Italian soldiers killed and missing in action during a special ceremony at the Monumento Nazionale a Vittorio Emmanuel II, also known as Vittoriano, arranged for by the Office of the Minister of Defense. The President General laid a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at the Altare della Patria, which was dedicated in 1921. This monument was created to honor the first king of a unified Italy, and it has played a key role in Italy's history. As the assembled daughters stood in hushed silence, few of us could imagine what monumentous events have happened at this place over the decades. The air was brisk, the wind lightly blowing as the daughters and guests walked over to the Grand Monument. All lined the sides of the 55 wide, steep steps to pay their respects. Our President General and her pages received extensive instruction about the protocol and procedures that would be required. To begin the ceremony, two of our President General's pages, Allie Dunklin and Rebecca Howe, carried the wreath, walking before Mrs. Wright and pages Jacqueline Leahy and Paula Eichenbrenner. The crowd was silent, and the pages and Mrs. Wright climbed the tall, steep steps. When reaching the top, they laid the wreath, placing it at the base of the main structure, the Altare della Patria. 
Describing the event in a recent conversation, Mrs. Howe recalled, I was so honored when Mrs. Wright asked me to serve as a page at the wreath lane at the Vittoriano in Rome. But what made the day even more special was being able to lay the wreath with some of my closest friends, including Paula, Allie, and Jacqueline. When Allie and I approached the wreath, we were shocked by the sheer size of it. It was bigger than any wreath I had ever carried in all my years of paging. As we looked in front of us towards the memorial and saw all the steps we would have to carry the wreath up, all I could think of was, don't drop the wreath and don't trip. Upon laying the wreath, all was still, and one of the soldiers in attendance played a beautiful rendition of taps on his bugle. Mrs. Wright then shook hands with her executive board members and descended the steps with her pages. The dozens and dozens of daughters and guests in attendance then assembled for group photos with the executive board. So many so honored to be there for this special event, kicking off our week of excursions, each almost more incredible than the last. It was such an honor to be in attendance at this wreath laying. But one of our favorite things was seeing that even as we were heading home a week later, the wreath was still there in its wonderful place of prominence at the base of the altar. Seeing it there still, it let us all know the daughter's visit there would not be soon forgotten, neither by us nor by a very hospitable Rome. We leave you today with this quote by George Washington. Every post is honorable in which a man can serve his country. Well, thanks for listening and be well, dear friends. Let's celebrate the stars and stripes forever. And remember, with all of your ancestors behind you, you are the result of the love of thousands. Well, this podcast is written and produced by our incredible team of writers and editors. And we are, as always, so grateful for President General Pamela Edwards Rouse Wright and Historian General Suzanne Heskey for their constant guidance. To all of those who participated in the recitation of the American's Creed, thank you so much. They are in order of appearance. Our President General Pamela Edwards Rouse Wright, Bev, Catherine, Megan, Paris, Michelle, Myrnie, Jackie, Rebecca, Adele, Janet, Susan, Sandy, Holly, Mackenzie, Cindy, Morgan, and Ashley, thank you so much for your time. The National Society Daughters of the American Revolution is a nonprofit, non political, volunteer women's service organization dedicated to promoting patriotism, preserving American history, and securing America's future through better education for children. Members are all lineal descendants of those who supported the cause of independence in the Revolutionary War. For more information, please visit DAR.org. This is the DAR Today podcast.